got out there today too, isn't it? Isn't it great to see uh, uh, sunshine and uh, and springtime? If you're visiting with us, we're thankful for your visit and we appreciate you just being back every chance you get. And uh, fill out a visitor's card if you haven't done that already and give us a record of your visit. We do have several updates on our prayer list and I would like to share those with you. Be sure and check the bulletin. Make sure that you... Uh, you have all the information and up to date. There's a, definitely a lot of information in there that we, we certainly don't have the time to cover just during the announcement time. Added to our prayer list this morning, uh, Owen McWhorter. This is one year old son of Anthony and Lori McWhorter, also a cousin to uh, Brian. He gave me an update, said that Owen is in uh, TC Thompson and is sedated right now. And we're hoping that that continues to get better. One year old uh, having a serious condition with a, a rare illness or a, a allergic reaction to some medicine they think it might be. We also added uh, Marilyn Don to the Dodd to the prayer list this morning. She is out sick, as well as Ruth Crow, who's out sick, having some health issues. Uh, we also added Lamar McWhorter, it's in-laws of, of the, the Shields, the extended Shields over there. Even if you're not a Shield anymore, I'm still going to call you one, I guess. He's uh, in the hospital having test run. That's Lamar McWhorter. Uh, I also want to continue to remember J.L., who was out this morning, as well as uh, Barbara Sintel also. Also added to prayer list this morning was John Holland, a member of Chickamauga, who's going through cancer treatments. We certainly want to continue to keep David in our prayers. We're very thankful that uh, we have a good people like Ken, who's going to be speaking today, and Dalton, who spoke last week, fill in while David's gone. and We look forward to maybe having David back Wednesday night, if not, uh, maybe next Sunday. We hope that he'll certainly get to feeling better. Don't forget our Vacation Bible School meeting right after evening worship tonight. Please be sure and meet down front right after worship for that, after a little bit of social time, I'm sure. Uh, also, as a reminder, the uh, Tuesday Bible class for this week is canceled for this week. We hope it'll resume next week. So mark it off your calendar for this week. And don't forget, next week is the last Sunday of the month, and that is a fellowship meal following morning worship. So we'll have morning worship, we'll have a meal, and then we'll have uh, afternoon worship at 2 p.m. instead of the normal 5. So plan on uh, having having a worship time and a meal, and, and then another worship time right back to back. Also, don't forget our, our men's breakfast on April 2nd. There's sign-up sheets for that on the bulletin board. Also, the following Sunday, April 3rd, will be our youth-led worship, so we certainly want to be here and, and uh, support our young men as they, as they do the work of the Lord. Young Ladies' Dates, Ligna Road, May 14th. There's more information about that on the bulletin board. And there's also a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board for family youth activities. So if you're able to help sponsor and sort and maintain a youth activity, we would encourage you to do that and sign up for it. That's all the announcements I have at this time. At the proper time, we'll have a scripture reading by Joey Durham, and that'll be Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4. Our opening prayer will be led by Frank Sintel, and our closing prayer by Lee Holloway. We'll turn the song service over to Dawn. Our opening song will be 943. 943. We'll sing this through two times and then we'll have our scripture reading for the evening. <clears throat> I love you.
scripture reading this evening will come from Psalms chapter 4. Psalms chapter 4. Through the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Oh, whoops. Hear me when I call you, O God, my righteousness. <clears throat> you have re revealed me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you? O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of, of your conscience upon us. You have put gladness in, in my heart more than in this season that their grain and wine increase. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O oh Lord. Make me dwell in safety. For our opening prayer this evening, let's sing 871, both verses of 871. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Lord, Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to, to meet together with your people, to worship you, to sing these songs of praise to your name, to listen to your word taught. We thank you for this blessing. We thank you for the freedom we have in this country to, to do this. But especially we do thank you for the gift of your son who came to this earth and died on that cross, that old rugged cross. We might have hope of heaven. Thank you for the blessing of of the hope of heaven. Thank you for all the spiritual blessings that you that you give us. Thank you for the material blessings that have been ours through the past week. Help us to use all your blessings wisely. Always look to you for guidance. Bless us that we may worship you in spirit and truth. We all may, always may serve you. Bless this congregation of your people. Help us to work together in love. Help us to seek to lead the laws to you and to encourage one another to serve you. Bless each effort we make to do, do your will. Bless our nation. Help us to we pray for our leaders and to encourage them to do what's best for your people. Forgive us. Bless us through the evening and the night. In Christ's name, amen. If you'd like to make note of 556, that will be the song of invitation this evening. 556. 
Before the lesson, we'll sing 821. 821. If you're willing and able, would you stand with me as we sing this song? <coughs> sing all three verses. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. It's a blessing to be back. It's a blessing to be here, have this opportunity that I can share another lesson with you. Get the clicker going here and see what we've got. Okay, and we're ready. This evening lesson is just a little bit different. But it's some things concerning Satan that I think we need to be aware of. So I'm going to be discussing some of those things here. But as we start, there's a couple of passages that I would like to read. From Revelation 12 at verse 9. So the dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. This evening's lesson concerns Satan's desire for you and for me. So we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing that. 
the two passages that I've just read tells us something about this adversary of ours, the devil, Satan, with whom we fight. We are in a war over good and evil. And we are those soldiers of that war. For God has put into our hands those things that we can on this earth do to fight the devil. So we need to take up that whole armor and be ready for this war. We need to consider Satan. I know it's not very popular to talk about Satan these days, but Satan is whom often our society would like to forget or pretend even that he doesn't exist. Perhaps at times we make a joke of him, caricatures, and perhaps what we see coming out of Hollywood. It seems Satan is maybe just a myth. Not so. Satan is real. We fail to remember that how the very evil and how very wicked and dangerous Satan is sometimes. In the time we have today, I would like to take and let's go through some Bible passages. And I would hope that you would follow along with me so we can do a little study from God's Word and see what it is that Satan desires from us. This is not something that we should take lightly. This is something that is serious, and we need to consider it that way. So as we consider Satan and his desires, I would like to present two thoughts to you, two things that Satan wants for us, what he desires for us. His desire and these two things, he desires of everyone that's here today, and everyone, everywhere. Satan desires these two things, whether you're young, whether you're old. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, what language you speak. Satan desires some things of you. He desires these two things, whether you have only been a Christian for a short time, or whether you've been a Christian for many, many years. He desires these things of us all. The first of the two things that I would like to bring forth is deceit. Satan wants to deceive us. That's his desire. We're going to look at some passages today that talk about Satan's desire in deceiving us. The first thing I would like to suggest to you is in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Genesis is the book of beginnings, and that's where we first learn and we hear of Satan. And in verse 1 of chapter 3, Now the serpent was more cunning than, the beast of, than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What we see here is Satan is cunning, He's crafty. He's effective in his craftiness. And we need to be aware of that. He has appeared in the form of a serpent. He comes to Eve with a question. Satan knows the answer to this question. Not only does he know it, Eve knows the answer to this question. And she tells it. In verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then in verse 4, And when the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We know how the story goes. Eve takes of the fruit and she eats and she gives also to Adam and he eats. In verse 4 and 5 we see exactly how Satan deceives Eve. In verse 4 he flat out contradicts God's word which Eve also knows. In saying you will not surely die and in verse 5 is where he lays out his temptation to Eve. He says to her, God knows. God is keeping something from you, Eve. 
God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan comes to Eve in the garden. He contradicts God. Then he lays out before Eve what a wonderful thing it will be for her if she takes of this fruit and eats it. For after all, Eve, you're going to be like God. The deception starts with a lie. It progresses to temptation, and then it ends in sin. Notice the ploy of Satan, how he uses it. Eve, if you will do this, good things are going to come to you. Notice with me in verse 6 of chapter 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was, get this, good for food, one, that it was pleasant to the eye, two, and was desirable, to make one wise, three, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband and he ate. Now, let's compare that passage with what it says, what it tells us in 1 John 2 at verse 16. 1 John 2 verse 16. I'll start in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here we go. For all that is in the world, here we go, one, the lust of the flesh, two, the lust of the eye, number three, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of the Father abides forever. So we have good for food, Lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eye, the lust of the eye. Desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. From these, sin originated in the beginning. And from these, sin has perpetuated till this day. Now back to Satan. Notice with me, Satan is coming, not coming in a red suit. He doesn't have a long pointed tail. He doesn't have horns on his head. He doesn't have a pitchfork in his hand. The way that Satan is depicted in every caricature you can think of. He appears in a subtle way. Not intimidating, but enticing. Let's look at another passage, if you will. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15. And no wonder for Satan himself, get this, he transforms himself into an angel of light. Consider that. Therefore, it is no great thing if, get this, his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their work. What does a minister of righteousness do if you are from Satan? Consider that. What would one of Satan's followers do when he transformed himself into a minister of righteousness? Satan can make himself and his ministers make themselves look very different than what they are. Ministers of righteousness, what might that apply to? I thought of maybe a wolf in sheep's clothing. What about preachers teaching error? What about this prosperity gospel and those that preach it? What about just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved and not only are you saved, you can never be lost. Would a Satan's minister of righteousness do such a thing? We should also look at Galatians 1 at verses 6 through 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ, to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you. 
and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we get it or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And as I have said before, so say I now again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. Don't mess with God's word. Don't change God's word. Don't change God's plan of salvation. Preach the truth. Has there ever been those who claim a special revelation from God, from heaven? Friends, there's been religious organizations that started over such as that. And they do not teach, they do not preach according to this verse. Many have perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ and those that follow those that teach such are in serious trouble. We see from Genesis 3 that Satan deceived Eve and it was very subtle way that he did so. In the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 11, warnings against Satan as he transforms himself into an angel of light. He can look very different than what he really is. Satan and his ministers are a threat to the truth. They're a threat to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are a threat to you and I. We must remain on guard. We are expecting Satan to come in wearing a red suit. We expect to recognize him as he is. That's not the way he comes. The dangers are there. Paul tells us, in telling those Christians at Corinthians, I marvel. He was amazed that they were going after another gospel. Things that had been changed up about the gospel. And it didn't matter if it was an apostle or an angel from heaven. And if an angel came right down right here right now, we're not to hear it. We're not to listen to it. Satan desires to deceive us. We need to accept that be aware of it, and guard against it. And he is very effective in what he does. If he wasn't effective in what he does, why would the whole world not be converted? Satan is effective in what he does. Satan can twist the gospel. Just tweak it a little bit here, and a little bit there. It was only one word that he changed when he was talking to Eve. Thou shalt not surely die. God said he would. Those in Galatia hadn't totally abandoned the gospel, but they were going after something we might consider shades of difference. Shades of something and not just the plain, pure truth. And we as humans, we can distinguish many things in shades, in colors. If we're looking at white, we know it's white. If we're looking at black, we know it's black. But distinguishing shades sometimes is a little more different, a little more difficult for us to do. What shade of black is that? And what shade of white is this? It is when we get those shades kind of mixed up, we start having trouble determining what shade it is. Satan doesn't come to us as Satan. He deceives us by disguising himself into what he is not. We therefore have to be vigilant and we have to be wise in what we consider when it comes to Satan and the way that he operates. As we consider Satan and his ability to deceive us, it would be helpful for us to understand the deceitfulness of sin, how it works. So we'll read from Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. Beware, brethren, lest any of you, in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. 
Satan is deceitful and he wants to deceive us. And it's through sin that that occurs. There's something else about Satan that we need to be concerned about. His desires for us concerning how he works, his deceit on us. How he deceives. It has been said and it is true that habits are formed over a period of time. From a young age, many times, habits are formed. Babies sucking their thumb or a pacifier or having a particular blanket that they can't go to sleep unless they have it. Then comes the time to break that habit. That is certainly a sad time and an unpleasant time for a child as well as the parent who is trying to take a comfortable thing away Sin is a lot that way, you know. People get into the habit of sinning, and before long it becomes normal behavior. And then what does sin do? It tricks you. It deceives you. Satan wants sin to be a normal behavior for us and consider it not to be sin, not to be so bad. Well, I'm not doing as bad as the other man is doing. And then consider the pleasures of sin. There are pleasurable things in sin concerning the flesh. From Hebrews, exhort one, exhort one another daily, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we can remember that sin is going to deceive us and Satan is the one that's going to be behind that. Satan's desire to deceive us, to trap us, to have us do what God would not want us to do. There's another thing that Satan wants to do. Not only deceive us, but he wants to kill us. Yes, he wants to kill us. He wants us dead. What's interesting about that is the scripture tells us that he is not someone to be trifled with. He is, in fact, very dangerous. In John 8, at verse 44, Jesus there says something about Satan. He tells us that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus says, make no mistake, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. The first one he murdered was Eve. Just go back to Genesis 3 and consider it. Remember what Satan says? He says to Eve, what God said to Eve and the answer that was given and Satan answers back and says, you shall not surely die. And what happened next? Eve takes of the fruit and in that instant she died. And she gives to Adam and in that instant he died. Not physically. Oh, that's going to come later. But they died. Satan is a murderer. In that moment, they fell from the relationship with God. Their fellowship with God ended there because they died spiritually. They're separated from their creator and they were cast out of the garden. Satan was a murderer from the beginning and he is a murderer today. Satan is out to get every one of us. He's out to get our spouses. He's out to get our children, our parents, our neighbors, our co-workers. He's out to get us all. And it's like someone stalking another. We hear of stories of people stalking other people and how horrifying that is. A predator that's out to do harm. And if a predator was after our families, what would we do? We would do everything in our power to protect ourselves and protect our family. We take great concern with that. Well, what about the stalker 
that's after your soul. How shall we consider that stalker, that predator? We need to understand that Satan is out to get us. He wants to deceive us and he wants to kill us. For he is a murderer. There is not a single soul in this room or anywhere else that Satan himself is not after. Because he would have every one of us killed if he could. Scripture tells us Satan is anything but harmless. Go with me to 1 Peter 5 at verse 8. And Peter tells us there, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Get this, seeking. He's a predator, seeking whom he may devour. Sounds like Satan is, in fact, stalking us. And who's he talking to here? Christians. He's already got the lost. He's stalking the Christians. Generally speaking, we live our lives relatively safely. Generally, we just come and go as we please without fear of predators and stalkers. But such was not necessarily true in the first century and before and after. For they actually had bears and lions. We read about those things in the Bible. They loom in the shadows and are waiting to pounce and devour their prey. Peter's warnings would have carried a lot of weight with the people of that day. In biblical times because lions were actually there. They're not common for us. Peter is telling them and us to be sober. To be watchful, be vigilant, always on guard. We cannot let our guards down. Why? Because Satan is on the prowl as a roaring lion, and he's seeking someone to devour, someone to kill, someone to murder. And that someone is you and me. The imagery of Satan today seems to be... Uh, uh, let me start again. The imagery of Satan today seems to be all but the vicious killer he really is. But we have depictions of Satan in cartoons, in movies, in such things. But the depiction is not real. Satan is a murderer. Let's look at Revelation 2, verses 12 and 13. And to the angel of the church at Pergamos write, These things say to him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you. Where Satan dwells. Satan wants to kill us spiritually. But we should not be deceived. If he could kill us physically. He did. He did others. Who was behind the stoning of Stephen? Who was behind this martyr in Revelation? I am not suggesting Satan is all-powerful. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that he can just pick and choose and physically murder someone. But if he could, if he could have a hand in it, if some of his ministers could have a hand in it, getting some Christians out of the way might be to his benefit. We're fighting against his cause, aren't we? Satan has a desire for us today. He desires to deceive us. He de desires to kill us, to destroy us any way that he can because he's fighting against God and he wants to destroy God's cause. We are God's workmen in this life. So if he can get rid of some workmen for God, that would be an advantage to him, do you think? And why? 
because Satan knows where he's going. He knows what his end is. And he knows he may not have much time left. For the day's coming that all is going to stand before the judgment seat. He's opposed to God. He's opposed to righteousness. He's opposed to everything good. Everything that we are for, he's against. Satan wants you to be with him. God wants you to be with him. What about our spouses and our children? Satan wants them too. What about our friends? He wants them too. Our neighbors, he wants them too. But God wants them. God wants them to have life. He wants all of us to have life. There are things that we should understand when it comes to the workings of Satan and what his tricks are, what his deceitfulness is. So hopefully now we have a better grasp of Satan's desire to deceive us and to kill us. But there's more. And the more is the bright side of things. And that bright side we learn from Scripture. Satan loses this war. We know that. It's in the meantime that we're in this battle. Satan loses. God wins. And Christians win with him. But we have to stand. We have to be vigilant. We have to be faithful. All who are faithful in Jesus Christ wins for all eternity. God has not left us alone. In James 4, verses 7 and 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do we believe those words of James? When Satan comes up against us, if we give in to his, re his deceit, then we haven't resisted him. James says, resist the devil and he will flee. But sin is deceitful. And if we're not careful, we wind up doing the same thing Eve did, giving in to the lust of the flesh, to the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. So we must be careful. Giving in to those things... Yes, it's deceitful. But giving in to those things is also surely spiritual death. Listen to what James says in James 1, 12, 12 through 15. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to give to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The deceitfulness of sin can kill us. Within us, we may have desires that can lead to sin if we give in to it. The desire starts in the mind, the heart, and it progresses into action. Luke six forty five: a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good, and get it. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks God says we are not alone. God says if we resist, we can overcome. We do not have to give in to temptation. But that does not stop Satan from wanting to deceive us, does it? Satan has an ultimate destination. Revelation 20 at verse 10, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are. 
and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. In the book of Revelation, God wants us to see what the reality of the situation is. Revelation was written to Christians who were being persecuted. Saints were dying for the cause of Christ and for their faith. We struggle today with the fact that Satan is out to get us and that his people are working with him and for him. Satan ends up in a place which we do not want to be. He wants to take as many of us as he can with him to that place. And all these things, we are victors in Christ, as well as Christ is the great victor. Listen to what the words of Romans 8, verses 33, beginning tells us. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution or famine or nakedness, nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Get it? Counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Christians were dying for the cause of Christ. There may be some dying for the cause of Christ in parts of the world today. We are conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angel nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God loves us, and he loved us so much, and he wants to do so much for us if we would just participate on God's terms. It's God's terms by which we must live. The world has other terms that they would want for us. The final chapter of it all is how does the story end? If you're wondering how it's going to turn out because you find yourself being buffeted by Satan and you find yourself buffeted in a hostile world and you wonder sometimes, is it all worth it or not? Hear me, the message of the scriptures. God wins, faithful Christians win, Satan loses. The only question for us today is, what side are we on? To whom do we pay our allegiance? To Satan or to God? Acts 4, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Satan has plans for you, but we should never forget. So does God. Satan does not want one to obey the gospel, to become a Christian. He does not want us to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. But, but if you obey from the heart that form of doctrine and become a Christian, he would have you fall away and get you back into the world and be enticed and be deceived by sin. If that doesn't work, he will do all he can to render you inactive. And we see that from time to time. Churches that are just inactive, they are not carrying out the will of God. You're just there. Not fighting the good fight, but just showing up on occasion. Not participating in the work of the church. There are many things, many more things that can be said about Satan. Don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let Satan kill you. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the 
the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father except by me. The choice is left up to us. We're not mechanical beings. We have the ability to decide what we want to do. We decide whether we want to be participants in sin, and we decide if we want to be participants in the cause of Christ. Revelation 21, beginning at verse 6. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Do not be deceived. Galatians 6 at verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. We would suggest choose life. The choice of life and death given by Moses to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 30 at verse 19 can be the same for us. I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. The same choice exists for us today. What do we choose? Do we choose life or do we choose death? Decide today to give your life to Christ that you may live eternally with him. And you can do that by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can do that by obeying the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But one must repent of their sins. They must turn from their way of life to God's way of life, forsaking sin and living for the Lord. Confessing his name before others and being buried with him buried into Christ through baptism where the remission of sins occurs. In Colossians 3 at verse 3, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The sins are gone. Our life is hidden in Christ. Yes, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for we're not promised another. For what is your life but a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away? And I end with this. Revelation 22 at verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears it say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Won't you do that? Won't you take of that water of life at this time as we stand and sing? The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide.
to this evening. If you were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you have the opportunity to do so as soon as we dismiss. If you'll head down this hall to your left as you're headed out, the door there just a little ways on the right. If you'll uh, hop in there, someone will meet you there shortly and will serve you. Let's sing number 333, the first and last verses, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. 333. In the land of endless days, lies the city foursquare. It shall never pass away, and there is no light there. God shall watch over all tears. There's no Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that thou hast blessed us with. Father, we especially want to thank thee for this opportunity that we've had to come together to study thy word. May we take what has been said here and go out and use in our everyday lives and teach others, Father. Father, be with all those that were mentioned here tonight as being sick. Father, may they return to their much-wanted health and be back with us. Father, especially be with David as he's recovering from his surgery. Father, be with him in everything that he does as he goes through this process of healing. Father, thank you for those that have filled in in his place, uh, Ken and Dalton, as they have filled in so good. Father, be with all those that were in the hospitals. Be with the doctors and the nurses as caring for them. Father, be with us as we depart. Bring us back to the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.